So, uh, Julia, in one of your interventions in the public debate about the right to be forgotten, you affirmed that, quote, America may look back at its condemnation of Europe's data protection rights of one of the moments when we lost our way, unquote. And recently, a team of researchers that is also uh, uh, have one of a public figure in Brazil, Virgilio Almeida, which of is a former uh, chair of CGI. Uh, this group of researchers uh, uncovered the possibility of re-identifying people who have the made the indexation requests, undermining, quote, the spirit of the Court of Justice of the European Union legal ruling. So. How do you understand the relationship between these issues and your conception uh, of what would be a right to be forgotten and which disputes and interests are involved in defining the theoretical, theoretical limits of this new but impactful legal concept? Thanks. Thanks very much and really nice to be here with you both. Um, look, it's great to have an opportunity to talk about that um, recent paper. So this is a paper um, by Virgilio, a team of researchers at NYU, uh, China, and uh, in New York. And we got a lot, lot of coverage out of a New York Times cover. I actually spoke on a panel at the CGI annual seminar with Virgilio and also the lead um, counsel for Google about this. And I think it's, it to some extent, misrepresents what's really going on with the right to be forgotten. So one thing about that study is that it looked at 283 URLs which is a very tiny sample of the URLs that have been requested. There's been now 1.46 million. So we're talking about a sample set of 0.017% of those requests. Um, and they were a particularly biased set, as well as I think having some problem with statistical representation. They were also quite biased because they were compiled from lists republished by British news organisations. And for some background, I have worked um, at The Guardian, I'm quite familiar with the British media scene, uh, and those organisations that have republished this have quite some animosity to this ruling. They have animosity at two levels. One is they, of course, being um, part of the fourth estate, interested in bringing truth to, um, in truth to power and everything, they want to make sure that the public record is maintained, and so they're concerned about the, the sort of fundamental basis of what they perceive to be um, the right to be forgotten. Here, the forgotten language is quite controversial. The second dim dimension, I think, that's really interesting behind their position is that they feel quite disempowered in the whole process because how Google, and we'll hopefully talk about this, um, has implemented this um, European uh, right to be forgotten is in a way that doesn't engage in any way the publishers. And so what Google does is makes a decision based on a request from an um, internet user, and then it, after having made a decision, sends no information about the ruling, but it sends a URL to um, the newspaper. And when that first started happening, I was um, with some of the first requests came to The Guardian and the BBC, and the reporters were up in arms because there were these stories that are being removed from the internet. They quickly actually stepped down from that position. So it was James Ball at The Guardian and Robert Peston at the BBC, and they realised that it wasn't the subject of those stories that had made a request. But in the BBC case with Robert Peston, it was actually a commenter on a story who wanted to have that story delisted so that one comment he'd made 10 years earlier didn't continually appear at the top of his search results. So um, if, if we then go back to this study by the, the NYU researchers, what they were trying to show was that there's a problem with how this right is being implemented. And they're also criticising the decision to, of Google to issue these notifications. And I think that what they missed in that is that part of the issue is that it disempowers publishers and it leads to misinterpretation. So I had actually looked at many of those links myself previous to this paper and identified who was the subject of the news story. It's, not, it's a trivial process, in fact. If um, the whole point is that a person who makes a request, they're named in a story. So if you have the URL, they're not removed from the story, they're removed from the Google's index when you search their name. So if you look at the news, you type in the URL and you type in each name in the story and you'll reveal who the person is. So I don't think it was surprising at all that the researchers were able to re-identify, as you say, and in fact, they should have had 100% re-identification. And the fact they didn't 
I think shows a major problem with this republication of lists, which is that the news organisations are possibly don't have a fully um, public intent in this. They are making a political statement. And in particular, a number of those links have been reinstated. So there were a few from The Guardian um, that were subsequently reinstated. And I was involved in the process at The Guardian to decide that actually we wouldn't republish the links. Because as the webmaster said, there's some quiet pathos in those links. And what they showed is that the individual, perhaps you had two or three links of an individual person's life unraveling, um, who has subsequently built a new life, then what the real purpose of the this set of rights, um, I think misnamed as the right to be forgotten, is that we can move on from our past effectively. And it's not about people, if somebody is a public figure, if the news is relevant, they cannot claim the right to be forgotten. It's not for those people. It's for somebody like an incidental commenter. It's another example in Virgilio's study um, was a, a, a gentleman who every time you search his name, um, there are news stories that say the word rapist. He was in an apartment where a rape occurred. He was not involved, he was innocent, uh, completely uh, has never had any criminal history and now is clearly, you know, you see that by affiliation, you, you would have some reservations about hiring this gentleman. And so it's for somebody like that. It's particularly for people who don't have a large public profile, whose information uh, is, uh, information in perhaps a high profile news story or in, an, in something else which is indexed high in Google search results, continues to affect their lives. And so what they are forced um, to confront then is this sort of perpetual present of past information. And I think a good way of framing what, we're tr what the intention of these rights is, is that we will still remember, of course, we can't actually forget. Um, and we don't want to forget. We want to build on the memories of um, what we've learned and so on, but that you can um, remember without constantly recalling, not being confronted continually with past um, uh, incidents in your life. And particularly when really the basis of the right is that information which is inaccurate, um, no longer relevant, no longer timely, and has no public interest can be removed from search results specifically on your name.